welcome back to my world of stuff. My name It's right along there. You may recall earlier in the week I posted my unboxing video of season 25 of Doctor Who, the second Sylvester McCoy season. And I did say that when I'd had time to run through the new special features and take a look at the episodes and so on, I'd come back and give you a proper review of the set. Guess what time it is. Hello, welcome back. Yes, it's time for me to talk about season 25 again. I have found time to take a deep dive into these box sets. The main attraction of these Doctor Who box sets for me is always the new special features, the new documentaries, the new bits and pieces that are created specially for these sets that take a look at actors and producers and writers and the shape of the show at the time, where it stood culturally. Those are the things I find interesting. I like all the odds and sods, the new bits and pieces, the new things that they do. And it's fun to look at the episodes, especially from this particular era of Doctor Who, when they're able to go back in and tinker with certain things and improve them visually. Because much as we love Doctor Who, great special effects sequences weren't always its forte. And that's not what Doctor Who is necessarily all about. But I think that if these things can be buffed up a bit, then why not do it? So I'm going to talk about season 25. I've had a chance to look at all the new special features. I've dipped into the episodes just to see what they look like, what's been done to them. I haven't looked at any of the special features ported over from the DVDs and Blu-rays. I will revisit them at some point. But I would imagine if you're watching this review, you want to know if you haven't purchased the set yet or if you're waiting for your set to be delivered. You want to know what these new features are like. Now, I'm not going to spoil anything. There's lots of little things actually in the episodes that I'm could spoil if I was that sort of person. But I will mention one because that did amuse me. So I'm going to look at the set as a whole and just talk about the new special things that we have in here. And the first special thing I'm going to talk about is one of the documentaries. Now, one of the great features of these sets has generally been a central documentary or feature that the rest of the set sort of revolves around. It's a sort of a, the main piece, the main documentary, which looks at something cultural about Doctor Who, where it stood, what was going on behind the scenes, whether it's anything to do with the show's creation, whether it's something to do with cast changes, major fluctuations in the format of the show at the time. We haven't had anything of that nature in the last few sets that I can recall off the top of my head, but I'm going to say that possibly the most interesting and poignant and affecting piece in this new set is a documentary that you'll find on disc two, the special edition of Remembrance of the Daleks. This is a documentary hosted by and introduced by the ever impressive Toby Hidoki, the comedian, actor, Doctor Who enthusiast who's hosted a number of these features over the years, looking back at figures from Doctor Who's history and digging deep to find out a bit more about them. And what he's done here is taken a, a name from Doctor Who history that some of you will know as Mike Smith on Remembrance of the Daleks. It's an actor called Dursley McClendon. He appeared in that one Doctor Who story and then had a fairly glittering career in London's West End on the stage. He made a few film TV appearances, but he was mainly a theatre actor. And if you know you who, you will know that he passed away in 1995, not that long after he made his appearance in Doctor Who. One of the victims of AIDS, which was a great scourge of the 80s and 90s amongst the gay community. Not much was known, really, I don't think, by people about Dursley McClendon. And because he's a bit of an enigma and because he passed away so young, Toby has done this 50-55 minute documentary, which explores the life of this young man who was taken away when his whole career was ahead of him. And he would have had a fantastic career because there's no doubt that he's an incredibly charismatic presence. He, he reminds me of a sort of a young John Barrowman in that sort of show-busy, jazz hands, shiny teeth sort of way. But he's a very good actor from what I've seen of him in Remembrance of the Daleks, watching it again. His first, one of his few TV appearances, he was an inexperienced actor where you wouldn't know to watch him. And Toby's documentary takes us back to his roots. It takes us back to his youth on the Isle of Man, when he became interested in showbiz, when he had to suffer with the cultural mores of the Isle of Man at the time and fled to London where he started his career with lots of glowing tes testimonies from friends and colleagues Sophie Aldred of course um, he was apparently good friends with another major Doctor Who figure I'm not going to name that person here because that's a bit of a surprise for you talks to his sisters talks to an art director at one of the theatres he worked in 
talks to somebody he worked with in Manx Radio, lots of people who knew him well and were his best friends during his time in London. It's a, it's a lovely documentary and it's really interesting because it is, I suppose, a, a snapshot of a particular cultural time when this disease was rife and, and wiping out, it felt like, a generation of young men. It's sad, but it's uplifting as well. It creates a memory of this man who would not necessarily be forgotten, but whose contributions to Doctor Who might not have been fully recognised. What's interesting that his life story was the inspiration for Russell T Davis's excellent It's a Sin series. And in fact, Russell is visited by Toby at Badwell Studios in Cardiff, where he talks about meeting Dursley and how he inspired him. And the interesting thing is that Russell didn't know that Dursley McClendon was a big Doctor Who fan. He was genuinely surprised by that. So that's a really nice piece. And I would say that's probably the central piece of this documentary set. It's, it's an unusual piece. It looks at what appears to be a minor performer in Doctor Who, but somebody who... Uh, represents an age, an year, and a generation. Elsewhere, we have three of Matthew Sweet's excellent chats. These are all about an hour long. His chats are usually about an hour and a quarter, but there are three of them here, so we're not being shortchanged. And Matthew Sweet is a terrific interviewer. He really is. He, he asks the right questions to allow his subjects to go off on one and go into a long anecdote and a long story that reveals a lot about the things that we want to know. Here he's talking to the inevitable Sophie Aldrich. This time, however, it isn't so much about her time in Doctor Who then, it's about her time in Doctor Who now. And it focuses on her coming back into the power of the Doctor a few years ago, Jodie Whittaker's superb final episode, and how she and others were reunited and brought back to the show. And it talks about her memories of Doctor Who, but it's very much a sort of a, a modern focused piece about her experiences working on the Doctor the show as it is now as opposed to how it was then it's also a very interesting interview with chris clough he was a director of many of this era's doctor who stories things like doubts on the bannermen and happiness patrol which is on this set and he is now a senior figure in british television he was actually the producer of mr bates versus the postman that was on earlier this year i think i mentioned that in my unboxing video and he also he's the first one of the first producers on brookside and he worked on the bill he's done He's done a lot of stuff over the years. He's a very experienced figure. And it's um, it's quite nice to think that he found the time to talk about his career and Doctor Who on this set. The third piece is an interview with Andrew Cartmel, who is the script editor, when all this Doctor Who chaos was going on in these seasons. And again, I've read a lot about him. I read his book, Script Doctor, many years ago. And again, because of him, I got a better appreciation of what was going on in Doctor Who at the time. Whilst I don't necessarily think this is a great period for Doctor Who, I can see that he was one of the people trying to make it a great period, trying to boost the show's reputation, pull it up by its bootstraps, and give it a bit of self-confidence again. There's often talk of something called the Cartmel Master Plan, because you may recall that he, throughout his time, he sort of seeds a mystery of who is the Doctor? What is the Doctor? And he had some ideas about what the answers would be, and, and if and when they would be answered as the if there'd been a season 27 of classic Doctor Who. Matthew Sweet doesn't ask him about that, unfortunately. He refers to it at the beginning of the interview, but he doesn't mention it at all. You know, what was your master plan or what were the things you had in mind? Which is a shame because that is one of those sort of dog tags that hang around the neck of Doctor Who and the people bang on about when they talk about this area, the Cartmel master plan. But it's an interesting chat. And again, Andrew Cartmel is somebody who has forged a career now as a novelist. I think he does a series of books called The Vinyl Detectives. He has an interesting and rose-tinted view of his time working on Doctor Who, and I think he elevates it to beyond where it was culturally. But then you can't blame him. He was charged with putting the scripts together, and he feels he did a good job all these years later. Why shouldn't he make a fuss about that? In terms of other new features, there is a... 25 minute, half an hour piece on the eighth and final disc called The Collectors, the 1980s. This looks back at Doctor Who Collectors and the history of Doctor Who Collecting. Largely focuses on uh, classic Doctor Who fan David J. Howe, who has a massive collection of Doctor Who memorabilia. And here he's talking about how that changed and the stuff that was coming out in the 80s as the show interested. And he started to lose its popularity a little bit, but was riding the crest of a wave of American popularity. There was a lot of stuff coming out in the early 80s. There's also a very frustrating Australian Doctor Who fan whose name I can't remember, but although he knows his stuff, there's a couple of times when he talks about a couple of Doctor Who stories, Tomb of the Cyberman and Revenge of the Cyberman. 
Naughty man. It's men. Return to the Cybermen. The whole thing is hosted by Emily Cook from Doctor Who magazine. I'll just leave it there. Uh, also on the set, we have a 20-25 minute reunion between Sophie Aldred and actress Leslie Dunlop, who played one of the Happiness Patrol women in the Happiness Patrol. And they're just chatting about their time and their memories making Doctor Who and working in the industry at that time. It's a nice little piece, but you won't necessarily want to watch it more than once. And the other major new thing in terms of special features on here, of course, behind the sofa, those 30, 35 minute pieces where Doctor Who figures uh, watch constricted versions of the stories. They don't watch all four episodes, but they watch edited versions that give them an idea of what the story is. Here we have some familiar faces. We have Sylvester McCoy and Sophie Aldred. They are teamed up with three different performers from their this particular siege, which is a nice idea. We have a, a different faces in each of those stories. We have Karen Gledhill, who played Allison, the special unit sort of scientific advisor assistant in Remembers of the Daleks. In The Happiness Patrol, we have Dame Sheila Hancock. And the fact that she's still around and willing to sit on a sofa and talk about this ancient bit of telly is a bit of a coup for the series. So uh, she's there talking very fondly about the, the episodes. In the third one, Silver Nemesis, we have Mark Hardy, who played cyber leader in Silver Nemesis. And in Greater Show in the Galaxy, we have the comedian actress Jessica Martin, who played Mags the Werewolf in that four-part circus-based story. And it's nice to see some new faces amongst the uh, familiar faces that we tend to get elsewhere, because because we've got uh, Janet Fielding, Sarah Sutton, and the slightly spiky Wendy Pabry on the sofa, and they... Um, quite forthright in their opinions. They'll say we've got Sylvester and Sophie Aldred and various guests. And we have Bonnie Langford and Nicola Bryant who are having a hoot watching these old stories. And these things are always interesting. They're always fun. They're always nice to watch. And it's interesting in this one to see the, the differing opinions that they have about these episodes. I mean, uh, Wendy Pabry and co have very little time for the Happiness Patrol. And yet, of course, Sheila Hancock is effusive about it and it sets and it's the way it was filmed and so on. So I think that's the most interesting thing about these particular features is the different opinions from each of the sofas about these episodes and sort of contrasting their different viewpoints. But again, they're things that you watch once because once you've seen people laughing at the Doctor Who title sequence, you've sort of seen it and you don't need to keep seeing it. But it's, it's fun that they do them and I don't object to them being there. In terms of any other special new features, there are some other bits and pieces on here. There's, I think there's more old comedy skits and chat showy type things. There's a bit I did watch yesterday. I'm not sure if it was on one of the original DVDs from an edition of the BBC's, I think it was a daytime TV discussion show, Open Air, in which the slightly irritating Eamon Holmes, a younger version thereof, is uh, talking to Matt Irvin from the BBC Special Effects Department, later Sylvester McCall, and they're talking about science fiction and Doctor Who and so on. And it's quite nice to see Matt Irving brings some of his models that he uses in some of his shows. It's nice to see a old spaceship from Blake 7, a couple of space models from Moonbase 3 from 1973, a Silurian head. It's nice to see all those things sort of wheeled out onto a BBC um, daytime chat show type thing. There's lots of little bits like that, which I think might be new for the set, but I haven't looked at them all in detail. I wanted to focus on the, the bigger pictures. So, to the stories themselves. Now, the stories themselves are all represented as they were broadcast. If you're a completist and if you don't like change, they're here in their original formats, but there are new versions as well. They all have special editions. They all have special editions that have new scenes, extended scenes, new special effects. And from what I've seen, I've dipped into... An episode or two of all of them. I've watched three episodes of Remembrance of the Daleks because that is a great story. By any Doctor Who measure, that's a great story. And that's been perked up quite sympathetically. In fact, I will say that the new special effects here are more sympathetic than special effects additions I've seen in earlier stories. If you think of things like Day of the Daleks, Planet of the Daleks, where sort of modern CGI things have been rammed into stories that were very studio-based with primitive special effects. Here, the special effects from the 80s are a bit slicker, I suppose, and a bit more modern than they were in the 70s. And the new bits that have been put in do work alongside the original footage. Remember, it is particularly good because they haven't had to do a lot. There are a few things. One of them I am going to spoil because I think that's lovely. There is a, they've done little things like where the Dalek is floating up the stairs. They've 
CGI'd in the sort of underneath of a Dalek. Instead of just a bit of glowing light, you see those sort of what are supposed to be sort of the circular ball things underneath. This improved death ray sequences, that sort of thing. There's a lovely audio touch in episode one. Bearing in mind this story is set in 963. It's the 25th anniversary season. There's a nice musical sting in part one, which will bring a smile to the lips of classic fans. And I'm particularly impressed by the way that one of the things that people groaned about in the story was part of the action in the first episode is set in the junkyard of I.M. Foreman, which is supposed to be where the first Doctor episode took place. And everybody cringed watching the episode where I.M. Foreman was spelt incorrectly. It was spelt F-O-R-M-A-N. Here, by the wonders of digital technology, they've managed to put the E in. So it's, when you see the sign, and even it's on side shots, front on shots as well, it, it's spelt correctly. And I do, that sort of thing I really approve of. I really appreciate where they can correct production mistakes that shouldn't have been made at the time. Elsewhere, yeah, there's other bits, visual things. And I think the couple of extra scenes, longer scenes. There's a longer scene with the Doctor talking in the cafe um, and a couple of slight re-edits. And it, it it feels great. It looks great. There's nothing that maybe go, oh, that sticks out like a sore thumb. That's anachronistic. It, it is sympathetically done. And I will say the same for the rest of them for I've seen as well. Happiness Patrol works particularly well because they've added quite a few new CGI scenes that give a greater size and scope to the Terra Alpha planet location because in the original series, of course, it was all very much BBC Studio sets, street sets that just looked like BBC Studios. It didn't, it never really convinced us an alien planet. Here, by the addition of a few simple CGI effects of cityscapes and large buildings and the open air, you, it just opens it up. It opens it up and makes it look occasionally more like a planet rather than a BBC Studio. And these scenes are slotted in throughout the episodes to remind us of where we are. Uh, and that's, again, that's done very well. And I think it's quite very effective. I haven't watched the whole story. There may be more bits throughout. And if there are, if you've watched it, leave a comment down below. Tell me what they are. So Nemesis 2 has some new bits and pieces. There's some new scenes, extended scenes, because again, there was a lot of unused footage there. And there's one particular line of dialogue which did make me laugh. I think that's in the first episode when Lady Paintford has just travelled forward to 1988. So there's some nice extended scenes and there's a, again in episode one, again, I'm not going to spoil it. There's a very nice scene that links back to classic Doctor Who Cybermen stories. And it works. I first of all thought, oh, that's an unusual thing to put in here because it was not referenced in the story itself. But it actually works quite well within the story. And then we come to the greatest show in the galaxy. Um, I'm not entirely sure what's new here, to be honest. I've watched through a couple of episodes. I think it might be just a few visual sizzles, video effects and things. Um, uh, so I can't put my hand on my heart here and say, I can tell you what's new in this episode because it didn't seem to be a great deal. I think there may be a couple of extra scenes, a couple of extended scenes. Again, but unfortunately, I can't really say for certain because I think that was quite a good looking serial anyway. You'll know the, the making of that where the BBC studios were found to be riddled with asbestos. But John Nathan Turner, the ever inventive producer, said, let's put the show on right here. So they erected a big circus tent in Elstree where they filmed what would have been the studio interiors. Uh, I, from what I've seen of that story, I, I can't recall seeing a lot of new visual effects, but there may well be. So um, I do apologise for not fulfilling my brief in rounding up all the new stuff here. Also, of course, on Silver Nemesis is the debut of the 1988 American television documentary. I think I referred to this in my unboxing. And then there's uh, an edited VHS version of Silver Nemesis, extended version. So it's it's all it's all here and it's all there. Just looking through the booklet again, I think I showed you this briefly. There's also lots of old convention footage of the actors doing their things. There's a, a longer interview recorded with John Nathan Turner. There's lots of stuff, extra bits and pieces here. A lot of it is probably new to these sets, but I'm just focused on brand new specially made material for this set and i have to say it's excellent stuff whenever i see the trailers for these new seasons i'm always excited to see that they've done these new documentaries and they always give them a nice nice spin on what might be to a lot of fans classic 
Dot 2 fans, very familiar material, but I think they put a nice new spin in it, so it feels fresh and feels new, and it looks at things from a different angle. Season 25, I think, is Sylvester McCoy's best season. His first season was not great, and I think, unfortunately, his third season suffered. But this is a decent season, and I think the new material, the new effects, and the new additions to the episodes have really elevated it. And it's actually not a bad little set. So I'm going to give a season 25 of Doctor Who a good 8 out of 10. Good 8 out of 10. It's not my favourite season. I think the unfortunate things are that Remembrance of the Daleks and Silver Nemesis at their core are the same story. I always found the Happiness Patrol a bit dull. I mean, I'm aware of its political content and it's what it was doing and culturally there. But I just found it a little bit dull. And I do like Greater Show in the Galaxy. So I think an 8 out of 10 rating for the actual stories is justified bearing in mind all the new stuff that's with them. So yeah, it's a good set. I recommend that you pop out and pick up a copy or order one online, whatever you do. If you haven't got it yet, you've not been sure. I hope that this little piece might have made you think, oh, actually, there's some stuff which sounds interesting. And there is. There's, there are lots of lovely little visual Easter eggs that have been added to the episode. And they're not just things that are there in a sort of a knowing way. They actually make sense within the text of the stories themselves. So yeah, season 25 is another well worthwhile addition to your Doctor Who shelves. I mean, I buy all these sets and I think now this set completes all the 80s and beyond seasons. I think I erroneously mentioned in my unboxing that season 20 hadn't been released. It's on my shelf, it has been released. I don't think there are now any John Nathan Turner era seasons that haven't been released. So we'll be going back to earlier for me, more classic ages of Doctor Who for future sets. I'm looking forward to that. But this is not a disgrace and is well worth having. And I will say, all these sets, even for some of the really bad seasons of Doctor Who, and there aren't really that many really bad seasons. It's just that the wheel sort of was wobbling quite badly towards the end and they're less essential. But I think that the BBC and the people who work on these, Russell Minton, uh, Chris Chapman, they do a superb job in pulling together an interesting and well-considered range of new material. It's another winner. Right, thank you for watching. I will see you soon. If you're new here, don't forget to like and subscribe. There is lots of Doctor Who content here. There's a Doctor Who book review, special book review, coming up in the next day or so. And I'm hoping there's going to be a classic Doctor Who revisited next week. So there's loads of stuff to come. Non-Doctor Who stuff too. So yeah, stick around. Like and subscribe. Leave a comment down below. I'll see you soon until I do. Keep taking the stuff.